science and good journalism is the same, only as a journalist you have to write in a little bit more attractive way. Marketing and Entrepreneurship, a podcast by Into the Minds, marketing agency in Paris and Brussels. Hello and welcome in this uh, episode of our podcast on Into the Minds. Today, my guest is a photographer, a journalist, an anthropologist, a researcher. To write his latest book, he interviewed drug dealers in prison. Welcome, Teun Futen. Welcome and thanks for having me in the show. Thank you so much for uh, taking the time to answer my question. So your journey as an individual is absolutely fascinating. You are a journalist. You are also a war uh, photographer. You earned a PhD as an anthropologist. How did your experiences as a journalist and photographer actually contribute to making you a better anthropologist? Anthropology makes you a better journalist and journalist makes you a better anthropologist. My professor always used to tell me science and good journalism is the same, only as a journalist you have to write in a little bit more attractive way. The thing about being a war photographer is actually, I noticed that when I was writing my PhD thesis on the Mexican drug violence, I used a lot of my experience of 30 years war photography to compare the conflict in Mexico with other wars. And then I suddenly realized that being a war photographer is actually an absolute fantastic way to work as a cultural anthropologist to do a participant observations. You come very close to front line. You come very close to people that are actually at the front lines of the war and soldiers. You develop a report with them. And I only uh, noticed that, that when I was doing my PhD and it, it certainly all fell together. It is an incredible journey, but it's not that I started 30 years ago out and I want to take this journey. I mean, things happen and uh, things fall in place some way or the other. Do, do you think that being a, um, a photographer well, gives you an ability to see things that other uh, researchers actually do not see? Everybody has, has two kind of Mind, he has a rational, logical mind and a more irrational, intuitive mind. And as an artist, you use your irrational, intuitive mind. So, so some people they point at the left side or the, or the right side of the brain, but basically it's a completely other way of looking at things. And as a photographer, you look at images, you, you look at atmospheres, you look at feelings at emotions and as a social scientist you, you try to think in a very rational way you try to analyze and i think the oscillation between these two ways of looking at things is very unique and, and always keeps a fresh perspective and it's very hard for me to explain it in a concise way but as a photographer everything is new again and you start to look things at an open mind which will stimulate the way you look as a scientist your latest book is entitled drugs so i am translating obviously now from dutch to english it's entitled drugs and in the grip of Dutch crime syndicates. Can you explain us a little bit what was the starting point of this book and why you decided to deal with a topic that is well, a little bit risky, actually? Well, I've been covering wars and conflicts in Syria, so I always look at the margins of existence. Things always are a little bit risky and, and tricky and edgy, all the things I do. But it was very funny. Actually, it was not funny. I was writing my conclusion of my PhD thesis on, uh, on Mexico and then in my street, a granite exploded, and this was some action from the local drug mafia. And then I started to look in what was happening actually in my own city of Antwerp. And I never had looked into this. I was way too busy with the Mexican drug violence. But then I started to look what was happening in Antwerp and what was consequently happening in Holland. And I said, wow, this is pretty big. So what I actually did, I wrote to the Antwerp City Council a proposal that I would love to investigate as an anthropologist the drug problem and put it in international context as well. And how was it welcomed? They were very open-minded and I have a pretty okay reputation. The people I spent five months with homeless people in, in a tunnel in New York. I've done 30 years of war photography. I'm not too afraid of political correct to speak out my mind. So they invited me and people from the Department of Public Security. And then uh, we really got along very well. And then we worked a little bit on the exact storyline, the exact research questions. And then They gave me all freedom and every week or every two weeks, we just sat together and had a coffee and a chat and I discussed what I was doing and which direction it was going and they're very inspiring. So it all worked out very well. And at the end, I got permission to turn the scientific report also in a book. And my style of writing, even my scientific style of writing is, is already pretty accessible. But the book is, of course, a little bit more accessible. And the book really hit a nerve. It's, it's selling very well in Belgium and Holland. How did you proceed to uh, carry out the research? Uh, what kind of techniques did you use? 
as a journalist and as an anthropologist, I always use a combination of techniques. First is, of course, um, you research literature and then you research, of course, scientific literature, but also all the newspaper. And it's called very degrading gray literature, but I think it's just as important. You talk to a lot of people. I go back to my own experience from drugs. I mean, when I was a young kid, I knew a lot of people that were doing drugs in Holland. A lot of them died, unfortunately. But then, of course, you go around the neighborhood where things are happening. And a very important story of point of my story was, why do drug dealers actually deal drugs? And then you can do two things. You can read literature or you can actually go ask dealers themselves. So I made a deal with the prison authorities that I would give some readings in prison for the inmates. And then I give a few readings about Mexican drug violence and my work as a war photographer and the inmates really liked it. It's about guns and violence and, and drugs so they were very and then I just asked for volunteers I said listen I'm doing um, research for the city of Antwerp about drugs who wants to talk with me and I had like a lot of volunteers in totally like 30 people and I could go back to prison every uh, a few times uh, a week with a list of the people I wanted to talk and then they were called out and we were set in a little room where normally inmates meet lawyers and then we had discussions for an hour and a half and then they were very open-minded and of course I was a little bit discreet about the real names and about all the details but some of them said listen we love to help you and some of them were bored so they welcomed any distraction some people were just encouraged to meet someone else so I got a, a lot of cooperation from the inmates and they really had beautiful life stories I mean not beautiful but very interesting life stories and it's not my task to judge the inmates they already have been convicted but just to present their point of view and that's what anthropologists did were there any um difficult moments when you were doing those interviews of inmates no i don't have a difficult the only difficult moment is when people don't want to tell you things that you want to hear so that's no but there's never any danger never any aggression they were actually very friendly and i gave them all a photo book i made a photo book on the mexican drug file so they got all the book photo book from me as a present they were very happy with that i also talked to a lot of drug consumers and also from very occasional recreational use to very hardcore addicts and the same thing i really wanted to ask him how did you start to use drugs what's how did you like it what's your addiction what does it do with you and, and i had very intimate uh, talks with them as well it gave a pretty um, interesting uh, i would say quite unique what other people tell me it's quite unique inside view of the world of, of drugs Okay, so you interviewed inmates, well, drug consumers. Were there any other uh, profiles that you interviewed that were part? I talked with teachers that would teach at schools. I talked with a lot of police. I talked with a lot of judges, lawyers, scientists, journalists. I talked with people that lived in neighborhoods that were plagued by drugs. I talked with aid work. So I talked actually at police at all levels, federal level. A street level, I went along with a couple a few times with a narcotics brigade arresting dealers. I went with them uh, when they searched houses. So I talked to maybe nearly 200 people in, in total. You said about drug dealers and, and drug consumers that they had some, quote, beautiful stories. How difficult is it actually to, well, take distance from those stories and to remove bias from the interviews that you conducted? I think with 30 years experience as a journalist, I don't really have a bias. I mean, I see them as people who took choices which are not necessarily the most smart ones, but I don't judge them. I just take that as stories as they tell them to me. But of course, there is so much to tell. I mean, you talk to someone and he tells his story of 25 years of crime and misery and sometimes great fun, but a life of 25 years you catch in, in like three pages and of course you have to make choices. How would you well sum up the journey of a drug dealer? Are there any commonalities between uh, the different journeys? I talked to a lot of small time drug dealers and basically it all starts very stupid. They know a friend who's dealing some drugs and the friend asked to help a little bit. Other people dealing drugs, driving around in big cars and they just want to be like them. Just like in the rap song from Grandmaster Flash. Or some guy had a father who was dealing drugs and he stole a little bit of wheat from his cellar. Or some people tried to start to smoke a little joint, but then they need a little bit more money and then they start to deal drugs. It, it all starts very innocent. And then at some point they get somehow addicted to the... Uh, It, it's pretty exciting life. They, they love the money. They love the fast money. They skip school because why take an education if you can make as a dealer three, four hundred, and if you even are a mid-level dealer, two thousand an evening. And then they got addicted to the fast money, to the quick money, to the respect it gives them among their peers. So there is a link with poverty and with education, would you think? I wouldn't necessarily say that that social exclusion is a causal factor. It sets 
a breeding ground for people to be a little bit more uh, tempting to deal drugs. But there are a lot of people growing up in the same circumstances that choose a very honorable uh, path. They finish their school, they try to get the honest work. So I don't believe in that thing that social exclusion causes crime. A lot of people have to be very honest about that. And I was very honest in my book. And even the drug dealers told me themselves that it was not poverty that caused me to deal drugs. It was the love of easy, fast money. Do you think that there is a responsibility of, I don't know, media in putting forward stories of rich people, the importance of money, uh, big cars, in those people being attracted to uh, drug dealing? In a way, these dealers are victims of, of a capitalist neoliberal economy. I mean, uh, status is is a big car, fancy clothes, so they are completely in the capitalist mode of, of consumption. Of course, media portray people that have made it as stories of success, but of course, you cannot forbid that media are free to express what they want, but you need to work on other cultures. Culture. And a lot of these kids are in a very monoculture where, I mean, for me, status is like writing a good book or going to a good concert. That's for me, status or being admired for a scientific piece of work. But for a lot of these kids, status is like a fancy shoes, which cost like 2000 euro a pair. And you should break open that culture. For the least, you can get status by being a good sportsman, by playing in the band, by making a beautiful painting, by doing photography, or by being a respectable businessman. And I think that is very important to break down that monoculture of dealers. And that has to do with social poverty and with intellectual poverty. So it's not the first time that you are dealing with drug trafficking and, and crime. So you mentioned your PhD uh, thesis, and it was on Mexican drug Cartels. Do you see any differences between the Antwerp uh, case and the Mexican case? Yeah. By the way, for my drug story in uh, PhD in Mexico, I interviewed like prisoners, uh, rental killers, professional murderers in, in prison. So that there was kind of very interesting to get that point of view. But basically, I see a lot of patterns and structures that are the same. But I think the whole drug industry is like an underground monster, w which has its tentacles all over the planet. But it manifests itself all the time in a different way. It's like a fungus. If the climate is hot, And Sony, it grows very fast, like in Mexico, where you have a lot of corruption, very inaccessible regions, and great inequality. And if it's cold and dark, it grows less fast. In Holland and Belgium, we have less economic inequality. There is less corruption. There is less poverty. But it's still the same fungus. So we should be very careful. In Holland, people tend to be very self, a little bit smug for, oh, this will never happen with us. We are such a decent, nice country. But 30 years war photography has learned me that everything is possible and that civilized societies can collapse. And we have seen a spate of violence in Holland, liquidation of Kalashnikovs and even one beheading and a murder of a journalist that people would deem completely unimaginable 10 years ago. So with such knowledge on the Mexican case, on the Belgian-Dutch case, what is uh, the city of Antwerp going to do with the results practically? They were very happy with my research because it gave them an in presented uh, look at the mind of, of the drug dealer and give some entry points to design a policy and a drug to, you cannot eradicate drug crime because people always do drugs and there will always be crime, but, but you can at least keep it under control. And I think what I do pretty okay in Antwerp, they have a good combination of prevention. They help addicts. Actually, I work myself as a volunteer in, in a shelter for addicts where, where you give them meals on Wednesday evening. But they also have a pretty strong police presence, so there is also a repressive element. And you need to have a repressive, preventive and a curative element. You cannot choose for one path. I mean, Duterte in Philippines is only using a repression. And in Holland, I think there is way too much prevention. And I think in Antwerp, there is a pretty okay balance. It, it can be better. But in generally, if I'm very honest, the mood in Ant in Brussels and in Amsterdam, Rotterdam is way much more aggressive. And there are much more zones of no-go zones or zones zones of impunity than here in Antwerp. So I don't think they're doing it too bad. But of course, it, Antwerp is still the, box, the biggest port of entry of cocaine for Europe. So hopefully the city of Antwerp will be able to make something uh, out of all and the wealth of knowledge that you uh, provided them. Thank you so much, uh, Ten Upfuten, for uh, your time and for well, guiding us into uh, your research as an anthropologist. Okay, thank you so much. If you liked this episode of Marketing and Entrepreneurship, don't forget to subscribe. See you soon.